I'm not anti-car. I just, I'm not even anti-e-bike. I think anything that gets people out of their cars is, is, is a good thing, right? I, as I mentioned before, I think that the world would be a much kinder, much friendlier, much happier place if more people rode bikes. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Town Channel. I'm John Zimmerman, and that is Jerry Kopak from Bracken Ridge, Colorado. We're gonna be talking about time, how our relationship with time is, and getting out on the bike, exploring many different countries, and even just getting around your town by bike. It's pretty cool stuff. Hope you enjoy it. Let's get right to it with Jerry. Jerry, thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. Uh, John, it's so great to be here. I've been following your show for a while and it is just, it's an honor. You do some really quality work. Oh, thank you so much, sir. <laughs> I really appreciate that. Uh, why don't you just take a moment to uh, uh, share a little bit about yourself with the audience? Man, I always, I always hate this question. It's, it's kind of like, where do you see yourself in five years? And I don't know, I think it's kind of, kind of an evolving question. Basically, I think right now, at least, um, I'm a wanderer, I'm a question asker. Recently, I'm an author and I'm a recovering cubicle dweller. I'm basically just a guy who's trying to use my experiences to try to make the world a better place one person at a time. But now that I think about it, there's, I do live by a couple of mantras and you can, you can test me on this if you want. First one is I'm relatively certain that the world would be a better, kinder, friendlier place if everyone rode a bike and stay with me. You don't have to be hungry to eat French fries. What do you think? <laughs> I love it. I love it. Prove me wrong. That's that's fantastic. And in fact, if I go to your website here, uh, that's exactly what how you uh, phrase yourself in in four Dang. words here is uh, uh, author, speaker, recovering uh, cubicle dweller. So yeah, five words. Boom. You, you're right on point there. Um, so where did you grow up? Ah, I grew up in this little small town called Eaton Rapids, Michigan. And honestly, if you did a search on Google for Middle America, Eaton Rapids just might come up. It's probably 5,000 people. I think I had 180, 175 in my graduating class. And it's just this quintessential quaint little farm town just 30 miles south of Lansing. Yeah. And there's a river that runs through there. There's a little island on there. And after school, when we were kids, we'd go and get some day-old loaves of bread and feed the ducks. So, I mean, it was... It was a really amazing place to grow up. Fantastic. Yeah, I just pulled up the Google Maps uh, here. And oh. yeah, you're right. It's it's just uh, just south, yeah. a little bit west of Lansing and uh, uh, not far from uh, from Chelsea. I've got some friends in Chelsea and ah. uh, and uh, yeah, in Ann Arbor. That's where I did my graduate work. So I'm familiar with that area. Be actually, beautiful country. Do you, uh, do you know Eaton Rapids though? Probably not. I have never been to Eaton Rapids. Yeah. I mean, yeah, there's, there's a there. thousand little small towns just like it all over the place. So it's yeah. just the Midwest. It's a great place. Yeah. Yeah. So that's where you grew up. And then yeah. you, you're, you're, you're joining us from where, where, where are you located right now? I am now in the mountains of Breckenridge, Colorado. So I've been here for about five years. I moved to Boulder for college in 1994 and lived in Boulder until probably 2018 and then moved up here and I've been here ever since. Wow. Okay, cool. And you and I were, were talking before we hit the record button. We were in Boulder pretty much the same time. We overlapped uh, quite a bit uh, there in that area. Uh, what did you uh, study there at, uh, at the university? I was a business guy. So I was a finance major and I don't know if you ever get, grew up watching movies. So one of my movies that I always loved, and it was, it seemed like it was a staple through business school, was this movie called Wall Street with Michael Douglas, Charlie Sheen. And it, it seemed like everyone in my class knew that movie, had it on, on repeat in their brain, on a loop, and could quote every scene from it. And I had this mindset that I wanted to, to be a banker like that. And then, I don't know, it, things change in your life and your perspective shift and realize that that really wasn't where I saw myself long-term. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and really 
I, I think I, I already predict that there's a through line going here because when we look at what your childhood was like and life back in in Michigan, uh, this is the image that hey. uh, that you share on your about page, uh, <laughs> and you know that that kind of looks like my bike a little bit. I'm a little older than right? you are, but uh, you know I can I can remember uh, getting around uh, town. So so talk about that through line of what it was like growing up and being on a bike and then going to school in Boulder, it, which is a quintessential active town. I mean, the reason I, I named this initiative Active Towns was after Boulder, and most of my board of directors for my nonprofit are in the Boulder area. Um, so what's that through line of the bike you know, growing up and then in Boulder, and then you are this professional doing financial work and finance work (laughs) and banking work. Where's the bike at in that? And where's that through line on the bike uh, through your career? So first off, I love that you pulled up that page from my website. Uh, And (laughs) <laughs> look at this, look at the disproportional size of my head to my body. <laughs> I, I like to believe that I, my body has grown into that noggin. Uh, I don't know. Did I you ever it. see it's the great. movie uh, with Mike Myers? So I married an ax murderer. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. And he talks about like, hid, it looks like an orange and a toothpick. <laughs> That's kind of, sorry, I digress. Uh, how did I grow up with bikes? I, I think ever since I can remember, bikes were just this, this source of freedom, right? So I lived in this, this small farm town and my friends all lived far away. They called it out in the country. That was kind of like a Michigan term, I think. And I remember my first real bike was, uh, you know, not the ones you just displayed, but my first real bike was a, was a Schwinn. I think it was a world sport. It was black and gold. It was a 10 speed. We didn't call them road bikes back then. We call them 10 speeds because they had 10 speeds. Right. But I remember like my first real bike ride, I was riding out to see my friend Bill because in the summertime he had a pool. And of course that's what you want to do because the summers in Michigan, they're just hot and they're muggy. So I got on my, my bike, I was probably... 11, 12 years old, had never ridden that far. It was five miles, may as well have been 500 at that point. So I got loaded up. I I knew the drive because my dad had driven me there many times over the years. So I knew the road, but loaded up with a pocket full of Snickers, a water bottle full of Mountain Dew because it was Michigan in the eighties. And that's just what you did. And I got on this bike and in this epic odyssey to my friend Bill's house, it was five miles and, you know, your legs are burning and your lungs are like, I'm not ready for this. So then, you know, you you flash forward and bikes are still this part of my life. And I have this opportunity to move to Boulder, Colorado, which you and I know is like this bicycle commuting, cycling mecca of super athletes and just outdoor everything. And going to school in Boulder, the University of Colorado in Boulder, it didn't make sense to drive a car because there's bike paths everywhere. And actually it's, it's just easier to get around town on a bike. I would, I would continually race my friends who would be driving to, to the gym or to, to campus and they would be driving and I'd be in my bike and I would routinely beat them by four five, six minutes. And, you know, long story short is that bikes have just always been this part of my life. And to the point where I just started saying that bikes always win because they just do. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So back to work. So you're in this oh, career, shoot. you're, you're back in this, yeah. uh, this, this cubicle dwelling existence and, and life happens, things change. Um, yeah. what happens? What, what, what caused you to change the, the, the that cubicle dwelling aspect of, mm. of what your existence was at that point in time? Yeah. So I think like so many people in, in Western culture, specifically America, you know, we're following this, this sort of laminated roadmap, this playbook to happiness and success. So you, you go to college, you get a good job, you buy a house, you meet your, your life partner, you have kids, and then all this happiness and success is then bestowed upon you. And maybe you know this as well, but life doesn't always play out that way. And sometimes things happen. Yep. And it really wasn't until I had the opportunity to found and run a hospice with my mom at the ripe old age of 31, which, you know, what did you know about death and dying at 31? Me, I didn't know anything. And so that's when sort of this light switch flipped on that there's something else out there, right? So 
as I mentioned, I used to watch the movie Wall Street a lot. And so I wanted to be a banker. So I thought, wow, the highest bank in the land is the Federal Reserve. And so I got a job there out of college. And I realized very quickly that this just wasn't the place for me. And so I fumbled my way through a few other corporate cubicle style career jobs. And it just didn't feel like what I was doing mattered, right? So I, I, think, it's, I think it's human nature to want to believe that what you're doing has a purpose. It matters. It impacts people's lives. And it wasn't until I had the opportunity to, again, found and run this hospice with my mom that I felt like what I'm doing, going to work every day, it's, it's important. It's impactful in people's lives. And, you know, how that happened was, was, was just lucky. Uh, my mom, remember, she had called me. She was on holiday with her husband down to Mexico. And I, and I won't try to recreate the, the enthusiasm in her voice because she's just a really passionate person. But quite simply, she said, calls me up and she says, Jerry, I know what I want to do. Cause at the time she knew that I was rather unhappy with my current career path, but you know, it was a standard career path that many people follow and she wasn't happy with hers either. And she's like, I, I want to start a hospice in Boulder cause that's where she lives as well. And you know, I'm kind of snarky, a little sarcastic and I'm 31, right? I'm following this playbook to success and I'm sort of making little incremental gains, claw my way up the corporate ladder and I'm thinking to myself, like a hospice, a hospice. Uh, hmm, I don't really want to start this makeshift hotel where right. people come in, transients, trash the rooms, et cetera, $10 a night, whatever. Mm -hmm. She says, no, 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 that's, that's a hostel. Right. I'm talking about a hospice. <laughs> and I'm just like, wait, what? What's a hospice? Because again, I'm, I'm 31. Right. So... Which, by she the way, uh, the visual on our on our screen here, folks, is he's filling in <laughs> the gap between twenty four and thirty six, you know, and and that was a pretty that was a pretty important moment there at thirty six. You won your first and only mountain bike race. <laughs> <laughs> let's not let's not gloss over that. Like yeah, yeah the let's high not gloss over. Of, Okay, but you're still, you're 31, you're class. going into this hospice, you're learning about um, near death care. And being able yeah. to help support people and and, yeah. and their families through a very very difficult period of time. Yeah, yeah, and we we had this 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 mentality, this mantra throughout our organization that simply read, "Every day is an opportunity to improve someone's life." Yeah. And I don't know about you and your background and many people, but working in banking or in telecom, like you may really love your job, but how many times you get to actually say that and have it be true. Like right. this was the first time in my career. And again, my career was only 10 years old. So I was doing what I thought I was supposed to do. But this opportunity to improve someone's life, it's, it's a powerful driver. And so I was, I was hooked and within yeah. the first couple of months once we started the organization. And then the added benefit of getting to work every day with your mom is, is an amazing experience too. So I never yeah. thought that would ever, that was never on my periphery graduating from business school, right? So working with your mom and working with people at end of life, that's it's yeah. way out there. So when you work with uh, older people and when you work mm -hmm. with uh, people who are nearing the end of their life, um, it changes your perspective on life. It changes your perspective on time. And hmm. one thing, you know, would lead to another and that particular uh, business uh, came to a close, but it changed you profoundly. It changed how you <laughs> viewed time. Talk a little bit more about this, because this is really the path that you've been on and the journey you've been on since that time. You're, you're so right. And I'm glad you brought this up. This, this is exactly where, I've, exactly where I've been for probably the last 10 or 15 years of my life. And so think about people you've lost in your life. If they were older, they're 90, 95, working with people end of life in our hospice facility, a lot of the people were of a certain age. And while that's inherently tragic and it's sad and it's difficult, I can sort of make the, I can sort of make it a little bit more palatable inside my brain, inside my heart to say that this person was 90, they were 95 they had a long life and I'd like to believe they had a really good life, but it wasn't until I lost a close friend at 45 to breast cancer and another friend at 42 to pancreatic cancer. And both of them were otherwise young, healthy, didn't smoke, didn't drink, 
vegetarian, et cetera, did all the things that you're supposed to do and none of the things you're not supposed to do. And it wasn't until those two separate instances that I thought to myself, like, wow, don't mess around. Because again, in this, in this Western mindset, we're taught to work our butts off until we're 60, 65 years old, and then you can retire and start living your best life. Well, what I experience in a very personal and profound way is that you may not get that chance because tomorrow's not promised. And right. that's kind of how I've evolved it to where I am with right now. And a big part of that is, is redefining what time means. Yeah. Yeah. And, and specifically, you know, how much time you have left and, and whether you do, you just don't know, like you found out from your friends. I mean, it, it could, it, the end could be <laughs> very near. You just don't know. And yeah. so that, that was a big part, I think, of, of that, that shift for you. Yeah. And I, I'm not saying that we should all look at today as our last, because I, I think that's maybe a little bit too granular or too short-sighted. But at the same time, I, I think that if, if we're doing something that inherently makes us miserable or makes us unhappy or just doesn't make us feel fulfilled in life, then try to make changes, small steps, whatever that it needs to be. And I, I came across this quote years ago when I was running a hospice I don't know who said it, but it's, it's stuck with me for, well, since those, those times, so a decade, maybe longer. And it goes simply to this point. Every person has a time bank. And every morning, 86,400 seconds are deposited into that time bank. Now, people won't, there's no one's going to tell you how to spend your time and time misspent won't be refunded. But at some day in the future, whether it's five years or 50 years, you're going to go to your time bank and find that it's empty. And it's at that moment, you'll know the answer to this question. Did I use my time well? And so that's, again, been sticking with me for a long time, ever since the loss of two close friends. And it just makes me think I am grateful for today. And how am I going to spend tomorrow? Yeah. And we're looking at uh, the landing page for uh, the product of work that you have put together. This is your book. And this is, I believe, I haven't read the book yet. I need to get it and read it. And everybody else does too, uh, because I'm sure it's going to be amazing. <laughs> but this is yeah. the product of this journey you've been on since that time, since those revelations about time. Talk a little bit about doing this. Um, you and I have a, a mutual friend in Ryan Van Duzer. He's, yeah. he's the guy who, who, uh, you know, got us connected. He just finished writing his book. And so his first book is out. Is this your first book as well? It is. Okay. And I don't know. Some people, they, they, they wake up when they're a kid or some point in life and they think I'm going to write a book. Yeah. And John, I'm here to tell you that never crossed my mind. Okay. I was never one of those kids who thought I'm, I'm going to write a book and I'm going to be an author. And to say it now out loud, it still seems a little, I'm getting used to it. Let's just say that it's, it's not what I thought going to business school, but it is the product of that. And I had the opportunity to, to travel. So I had some, some very, some things, very profound things happen in my life. And the book essentially is about the gift of time and how we choose to spend it. And, and what that simply means is I, I was a corporate guy, as I mentioned, for a number of years, and I had the opportunity to run a hospice. And then these lessons learned from running a hospice became lessons lived on a bike. And again, as I mentioned, I had this opportunity to, to travel a little bit. And what was supposed to be a two or three week trip turned into nearly two years on a bike as I found whoa, my way. Whoa, 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 whoa. You just can't gloss over that. How does that <laughs> happen? How do you uh, go off for two to three weeks and then, uh, yeah. Hi, mom. Yeah, two years later. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for catching me. So, you know that old adage where people say, what would you try if you knew you could not fail? Like, I don't know. That's, that's never really resonated to me because it's, it's so not grounded in reality. And also I think that fear of failure is really what drives and inspires people. I think that fear when harnessed can be a really powerful engine. I mean, how many people started fortune 500 companies or, 
or split the atom or did amazing things that they knew they wouldn't fail. Like, so instead, I looked at this as what would you do or what would you try if time was not a factor? And think about all the things in our lives. I mean, whether it's you, the, the, the day-to-day stuff, whether it's sports, athletics, everything is controlled by time. And I learned from the loss of two close friends from running a hospice that time is not, it's not granted. It's not forever. It's not a given. And so I found myself after the breakup of the person I thought I was going to grow old with, with the loss of my organization and, and my hospice, and also the death of two really close friends. And so I got on a bike and was going to go visit a close friend from high school who was living down in Zambia with his family. And I thought this would be just a nice little segue to take a couple of weeks off and then plug back in and start back up again. And the more I traveled, I started meeting people. And from Zambia, I met someone who said, you should go to Zimbabwe. And then from Zimbabwe, I went to Madagascar. And as I'm coming back after, I think, maybe six weeks uh, being in, in Africa, I met this woman who's a professor and she is from India. And I'm telling her my story and she says, there it is. And she says, you know, kind of with this, this awe, if you enjoy adventure and if you were not afraid of traveling by yourself, then you should absolutely go to India. And I'm not sure why she asked me if I was afraid, but I don't know, maybe people traveling uh, around the world by their bike, maybe it's, it's a daunting, it's a daunting task, but Anyway, so I found myself into India, and then from India, I found myself into Nepal. And then from there, I had been gone probably three months, which by, by Western standards and specifically by American standards, it's unheard of, right? So people get two to three weeks of vacation per year. And here I am realizing that I have this gift of time, and I've been living with this mentality to always say yes. Because you think about it, it's really easy to say no. Say no gives you this power to control or this, this feigning of, of control. Because none of us really have control of our outcomes. But then when you say yes, it exposes you. It opens you up to this vulnerability. And so I remember I was coming back from northern India and then found my way into Nepal and I was in Kathmandu and I met this, this Swiss couple. And I remember this is one of the things that just changed your life. Like we all have a certain number of moments in our life that you can just earmark as like, wow, this was a life changing moment. And again, I've been gone maybe two or three months and met this couple. They were also bike touring. So we quickly hit it off over dinner one night. They're talking about their stories, where they've been, my stories, where I've been. And they said, hey, so where are you? What are you doing next week? I said, I don't know. I'm probably heading back to Boulder. They said, why? Well, I've, I've been gone for almost three months. They said, we've been gone for over two years. Like, what? How is that? What? I, where are the, I can't even, to this day, I still stumble upon the words to figure out how that's even possible. And then so they asked me, they said, besides the fact that you've been gone for almost three months, why are you going home? What do you mean? I don't understand. Are you married? Actually, no. Do you have kids? No. Do you have a job? No. Do you have a dog? Like, no. Well, why are you going home? Ah, I, I don't know. What did you have in mind? Well, we're going to keep cycling through Eastern Nepal into Northeast India, into Thailand, Eastern Tibet, China. Do you want to come with us? And I thought, <laughs> well, I've known you guys for an hour and a half, right? Like what's the worst that could happen if, uh, if we don't get along, if we ride different speeds, if you don't laugh at my jokes, like, you know, we just, we peel off and we go different ways. But I'm thinking to myself, if I'm living by this mindset to always say yes. Then the only answer is to say yes and to continue on with these guys. Mm-hmm. And we've been the closest of friends. They became like my brother and sister and we were together 24 seven for like the next seven or eight months and just had some of the most amazing life changing profound experiences. Yeah. And we were uh, kind of going through some of your photos from Nepal and this is uh, yeah. some of your, your photo album uh, out on your website uh, folks. So uh, what we're seeing here from the images and uh, for those listening into the, uh, to this on uh, audio only, 
Be sure to go to uh, the show notes uh, for this episode and you can click on through and take a look at some of these beautiful images that uh, Jerry has out on his website. And just really the the richness uh, of the images and the smiles on the faces and the beauty of the landscape. I mean, the thing that comes to my mind when I look at um, images uh, of, of folks who are doing what you're doing, adventuring and getting out there and being uh, one with nature. And, and Ryan does a great job with this, especially with his content creation on his channel, is the, the beauty of it and how important it is for us humans to like slow down, take a breath and, and take a, a deep breath in and out and really appreciate that which is around you. Because so often, and this goes back to time and the way that our relationship with time, especially in the corporate world, is we're like on the clock. We're doing this. We're doing that. We've got goals. We yeah. have to do this. And you can do that, too, with even your adventuring. It could be all about, oh, I need to get to this spot and, and the pressure of it. But if you reframe what time means and you just take it as it comes, I mean... That to me seems much more healthy than the way the rat race that we're, we're sort of in in our society. I mean, that's my impression from the outside looking in. Is that is that kind of what happens? Yeah, I mean, a couple of things come to mind. And, and I know that I was incredibly fortunate, incredibly privileged to be able to take that time away. Like I'm part of the one-tenth of one-tenth of one percent of people who can do that. In, in the United States or even in the world. And so I understand that. And while I'm not advocating that everyone quit their job or have something happen and just take off because I know that's not realistic, I think it's important that people find whatever fills their cup, whatever find, whatever brings them joy. You know, whether it's going for a walk in the woods, whether it's going on your favorite trail, whether it's just getting on your bike and riding on the bike path. I mean, whatever sort of brings you stillness and whatever brings you calm and peace, I think that's what's what's important. But back to your to your point about slowing down. Sure, you can you can hop on a bus and you can find yourself at the Taj Mahal from in New Delhi going from Mumbai in India. And it's going to be amazing, right? The Taj Mahal is probably an incredible place. I personally never been there, even though I've been to India a couple of times. But the, the takeaway from that is traveling by bike allows you to slow down. And you're traveling through these, these rural small villages where people had probably never seen anyone who looks like me and for sure never seen anybody like me on a bike. So when people, people ask, what was your favorite part? Was it crossing this mountain range in India or was it riding through the Negev desert in Israel? Like, honestly, those were amazing, but it's the people that you meet along the way. It's those connections. It's the people that you have a, have a cup of tea with who invite you into their house and have dinner with, or people who allow you to sleep on their floor. Like that's the real magic of traveling. And that's the reason why I travel by bike as opposed to by a bus or anything else. I'm not saying that those things are, are worse or, or different or bad. I'm just saying for me, the true magic happens when I'm on a bike, those, when the connections are made. We're, uh, we're cycling through a few uh, uh, video <laughs> clips that you, you shared here. Where are these from? This is from Northern India up in the Kashmir region. Wow. And these last couple were from a trip that I just got back from in October of 2022. So about, uh, you know, several months ago. Mm. And I had been there in this similar region probably six years ago when I was traveling by myself. But this was the first time that I really traveled with a romantic partner. And so this was, this was different, right? So when, yeah. when you're traveling by yourself, you, you know, this, is, this, this video here is actually from, uh, from Breckenridge. We were okay, okay. Putting, putting bikes on our, our skis on our bike and then going a little skiing. So we'll, 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 do we'll, we'll hold, put a pin in, in this uh, video. <laughs> we'll, come uh, we'll come back to that. So talk a little bit about that. So, so you've been adventuring, you've been doing this for how many years? And then you met somebody special yeah. and this person joined you on uh, this adventure. Was this something that was out of the norm? for her to be able to join you on this? Or was she, you know, somebody who you met while adventuring? Oh, that's a great question. So my first bike tour was in 2005 in the mm -hmm. Pyrenees in Spain. It was, it was a one week trip. It was just kind of getting my toes wet and getting a taste for bike traveling. 
And then from there, I progressed into two week trips. And it wasn't until I had this opportunity to travel to Africa that we discussed already that had a longer trip. And so I did that for off and on for the better part of two years and came back, sort of plugged back into life. And then flash forward to 2022, that's at the top of the Annapurna circuit in Nepal, which is incredible. So there's opportunity to travel. So this person who I been with, her name is Christy. We had planned to do a two week trip to see some friends in Spain. And then she came to me and said, you know what? I, I really am not happy with my job and I think I'm going to quit. And I thought to myself, okay, if you're going to quit, then if we're going to have more than two weeks, then I have an idea. And so I said, how about Northern India? I said, I know the region well, uh, I know the terrain, the routes. And so it'll require minimal planning, but it'll require more time. Are you okay with that? And of course she's, she's competitive. She has, she had a D one hockey scholarship in college to play in North Dakota. So she's gritty, but it was interesting because traveling with a partner is a whole different mindset, right? So you're, you're a triath, uh, Ironman triathlete. So, you know, when you're out training, what your body's capable of, you, you know, that when you're hungry, when you're tired, when you're hitting that wall, I know all those things too, but now I have to think about someone else. And when is she hungry? When is she tired? And it's, it's a whole different experience that we definitely work through. It's funny because the first couple of weeks we were there and we were there, I think four weeks in the first two weeks, she kept saying to me, I don't think I should be here because India is intense, right? Like it's, it's anywhere from organized chaos to just straight chaos, which is personally why I love it. But after two weeks, she told me, I don't want to go home. This is what I want to do. <laughs> and so that made me completely happy because again, yeah. for me spending two years on the road, I love this life. Yeah. And so like, like you mentioned, Ryan Van Duzer does these trips. Like we're, we've both been fortunate to be able to build our career later in our, in our, in our lives a little bit to be able to accommodate trips like this three, four weeks, five weeks at a time and feel very fortunate with that, that, that Christy could join me for such a, a crazy epic adventure. Yeah. Now talk a little bit about this photo and then we'll go back to the skis, uh, on, on the bike. <laughs> so this is Kardung La. It's at the, it's, it's up in Northern India in the Kashmir region at the time, it was the highest motorable road in the world. I think it has since been replaced by a couple hundred feet, also another mountain pass in India. But 18,000 feet to ride a bicycle up there, is, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty memorable, which is why they have this sign there to commemorate it. I was yeah. the only person up there on a bike. This would have been in 2016. And yeah, it, it's, I started in this, in this the city called Ley. And Lay sits at about, I think, 10,000 feet. So I had about an 8,000 foot bike ride throughout the day. And the road starts off Only. pretty decent. Yeah, the, the road starts off pretty decent. And then it becomes just an absolute battle war zone because at that altitude, freeze, thaw, rain, sleet, snow, ice, sun, rain, all those things just absolutely erode away a road. And it's impossible to keep it nice. So it becomes essentially mountain biking on a road with just big Volkswagen sized potholes in the road and landslides, rock slides, avalanches. But it was a, it was a really great and memorable experience. I actually have that same picture framed on my wall in my living room because I loved it so much. Yeah. yeah. Love it. And the, okay. The, so you, you mentioned you slipped in careers and being able to do, yeah. you know, that. So, uh, obviously when you were on the road continuously for, you know, over a year, mm. you know, I, I'm assuming you weren't working remotely from your bike, bike packing. Uh, Correct. What are you, what are you doing these days uh, there in Breckenridge for quote unquote work? <laughs> so I, I no longer, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm a recovering cubicle dweller. What that means is I'm sure it's pretty obvious. I used to work in a cubicle and realized that just, it, it didn't make my brain or my heart happy. And so I've been fortunate enough to piece together several things. So in the winter for the last five years, I coach and teach Nordic skiing. So cross country skiing. And I also do some work for a international nonprofit. I do some finance work, which kind of keeps my brain sharp. 
In the summertime, I guide and lead bike tours around Breckenridge. And now in the, in the past couple of months, I've been trying to sell some books. So I'm just kind of piecing things together. I love it. And I've, I've been, I've been fortunate, right? I was, I was raised with really good values that I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a great consumer. What that means is I, I just don't buy a lot of stuff. And so I'll buy stuff and I'll have it for five or 10 years. So I don't really have a spending problem. So I can afford to sort of get by on a more of a, of a dirt bag lifestyle because I did that for two years on a bike. And I realized that, you know, how many pair of socks do I need? How many pair of underwear do you need? Like it's, it's a lot less than what you would think on a day-to-day basis. But, but Jerry, I mean, seriously, if you're going to be a skier and you're going to do that sort of stuff, you, you have to have, you have to use a car to be able to get to the slopes. <laughs> oh, wait. Oh, maybe not. Uh, <laughs> good pull. Yeah. So what we like to do in the mornings before, uh, before work is we put skins on the bottom of our skis for people who don't know what that means. It's this long strip of what looks like animal fur. It's not animal fur, it's synthetic, but it attaches to the tip of your ski and the tail of your ski and allows you to walk up the ski resort. Other people are taking a chairlift up and people would say like, why in the world would you walk up a mountain when you can take a chair? Like, I don't know. Why would you ride your bike over an 18,000 foot mountain pass? Like, cause it's there. And right. so we will <laughs> we'll do that in the morning at about six 30 or seven. We'll skin up the resorts and then we'll take the skins off and we'll ski down and we'll yeah. go to work by eight 30. And I yeah. figure you're, you know, you're, you're earning your turns. I mean, come on. Yeah, exactly. You know this. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So it's just, it's, it's a really cool experience to be able to ride your bike and do that yeah. again yeah. right there. And, oh. and people ask, like, do you have a car? Like, unlike Ryan Van Duzer, who doesn't have a car, has never owned a car, I actually do. I have a 2006 Subaru Outback that I've had for probably 15 years. And I don't think I'll ever get rid of it because I don't need to. It yeah, works. Yeah, yeah it's... Um it, it and, and I'm not anti-car either. We do uh, share one vehicle here in our household, and it's a 2005 uh, Honda Element, and it keeps oh, going. It. In fact, it's in the shop right now, getting getting some repairs done so that I can do a road trip up to Colorado. So, um, oh, I love that. Hopefully, hopefully I'll be able to uh, pop in and see you if you happen to be around in the June time frame. And uh, but yes. I love this. This I'm glad you had this photo in here because I mean that's the other you know kind of cool. thing thing of for those short trips, like I love having a car for my road trips. I despise sure. and never do use the car for short trips because I'd rather burn fat than oil, period. I love it. Yes. And it's interesting because the mayor in Breckenridge this year trying to get people out of their cars, he put out a, a alternate transportation challenge. So either take the bus one day a week, walk, carpool. I'm a biker, so I put studded tires on my on my commuter bike. Yep. And I, I bike to work every day at the Norwich Center. I haven't driven to work in probably four years. And yep. we've got panniers on the back of our bikes, and we can bike to the grocery store, bike to the gym, bike to skiing, obviously. Right. And so I entered my name in. Actually, my partner entered her name first, and she won the first month. It's like, well, that's great. Like you just won up to me. So of course I had to enter the following month. And fortunately yeah. I won that month. So, you know, I think we won like a $50 certificate to some restaurant in Breckenridge. And so it's just, it's a really nice thing that he's trying to empower people to get out of their cars. I think it's wonderful. And by the way, so folks, if you're wondering what Breckenridge mm. is like, here's just a, a, an image of, of Breckenridge. It's an absolutely beautiful, beautiful location uh, yeah. there in the mountains, uh, in Summit County, up in the mountains of Colorado. Um, I love it, too, because uh, it has a deep history in supporting bikes. Uh, the U.S. Pro uh, race uh, years ago was uh, had a finish line right there in uh, in the downtown yeah. area, and they really tried to embrace um, trying to encourage people to think about bikes for more than just sport and more than just recreation, really trying to encourage people to uh, imagine the fact that, hey, 40 to 50 percent of all of our trips are within easy biking distance. And if we can make our environment safer for people to be able to, you know, accomplish those trips uh, yeah. by bike and by walking uh, and sometimes by cross country skiing in the wintertime, <laughs> I love it. you know, why not burn some fat instead of uh, the oil? I, I love that. And actually that sign was taken from India, 
which is kind of interesting because there's a lot of cars in India and a lot of people who drive them a little bit crazily, but I, I, they definitely try to encourage people to ride. And honestly, like to your point too, like I'm not anti-car. I just, I'm not even anti-e-bike. I think anything that gets people out of their cars yes. is, is, is a good thing, right? I, as I mentioned before in my intro, I, I think that the world would be a much kinder, much friendlier, much happier place if more people rode bikes. Yeah. And maybe that's simplistic, but. No, I, I think you're right. And, and, and this also uh, is related to some of the, the, the work that you do uh, for this particular nonprofit, Warm Showers. Yeah. And um, talk a little bit about this organization, because it really helps to support uh, people who have this dream of of reframing time and getting out and doing uh, some exploration by bike. So talk about Warm Showers. I, I love this group. So I've been connected with them for probably about four years now. I sit on their board of directors. I'm also their finance guy. So what that means is, you know, I make some spreadsheets, do some financial analysis, and just basically look at our numbers and help keep us, keep us going forward. And what this organization does, you think of it kind of like, um, like almost like an Airbnb model, except you're not renting someone's house, right? It's, it's, all, it's all free. It's all gratuitous. So what people do is they'll look on our map if they're, if they're riding their bike through Breckenridge or through Madrid, Spain, or through Austin, Texas. And maybe they don't want to stay in a hotel and maybe they're tired of camping. They can reach out to one of our hosts on our network and say, hey, Jerry, or hey, John, do you have availability uh, on Tuesday the 8th? Because I'm going to be rolling through town. And sure. And there's no real standard of what the offering is. But when people roll through Breckenridge, whether they're on the Great Divide routes, which goes from Canada to, to Mexico, or the Colorado Trail, or the Transamerica, all those things come through Breckenridge. They may say like, hey, I'm going to be coming through. Can I stay at your house? And for me, I like to offer people, again, a warm shower so they can clean up because they probably haven't showered in a while. They can do some laundry. They can sleep in a bed. And I like to make them breakfast and dinner, depending on what time they roll through. And as I mentioned earlier, through all of my travels, through India, through Nepal, through Kyrgyzstan, Israel, Vietnam, all these places, the most impactful thing about those experiences were the people that I met along the way. And so now I get to be on the other side of that. I get to be on the giving side and see people roll through town and get to hear their stories of adventure. And with warm showers, what it does is it creates this, this safe platform and encourages people to travel, to get on their bike. And this organization is only for people on bicycles. So it's not for people who are hiking, not for people who are driving across the country, don't want to pay for a hotel. It's for bike travelers, which is what makes it so amazing. Yeah. And you, you, you sort of rattled off uh, some numbers from your adventures and, and uh, yeah, so 26 uh, countries, five different continents, uh, 99 uh, blog posts that folks, again, you can, you can uh, access all of that out here on uh, Jerry's uh, website. And again, that's wow. Jerry Kopak. Uh, what's not represented on here, though, is what you just mentioned the number of relationships and the number of people and those social yeah. connections that you, you do. And that's, that's hard to put into numeric calculations, that. right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, how do you quantify that? Yeah. So it's, it's interesting because one of the, the, the first questions I got and a question I get continuously asked when people hear about my story, first question is how many miles did you ride? Honestly, man, I have no idea. I, I don't have a Strava account. I'm not hating on people who have Strava accounts, but that's not why I took these trips. And ask me how many smiles I inspired or how many times I was inspired and smiled by the people that I met along the way. I mean, that's something that I would love to quantify much more than the number of miles I, I rode because honestly, I have no idea. Yeah. But the smiles yeah. are what really drove me. Now we've mentioned Ryan a couple of times and, and one yeah. of the things that he does is uh, he does uh, follow using a, a bike computer, the, uh, com the he, yeah. he 
calculates that. He uses Kamut and and some other uh, software packages uh, for his bike packing trips. Um, and there's some rhyme or reason to that because uh, you know when like when he's doing his, and I'm sure when you're doing yours, sometimes you can be out in the middle of nowhere, and it's kind of crucial <laughs> to be able to get to the next uh, place where you can get water. Um, and so he does True. have a computer for for that purpose of being able to do some routing. But uh, you you have some information here. Um, we're looking at uh, again on your website here, and it says curious about bike packing. Talk a little <laughs> bit about bike packing. Uh, Ryan and I have ha- did an entire episode about it. But why don't, from right. your perspective, why don't you go ahead and, and talk a little bit about bike packing? Um, how that sort of emerged? Because I think that you were actually doing it. You were actually bike touring um, and, and being part of this and, uh, and, and yeah. you know, out in the gravel and on some single track. And then all of a sudden this explodes as a thing, bike packing. It's crazy because when I was doing my first earlier trips, as I mentioned in Spain in 2005, 2007, I was in the Northern mountains of Vietnam near the China border. And there just, there wasn't this sort of offline GPS software that you would easily route yourself. So everything was paper maps, which made it a little bit more adventurous, but also you didn't, you couldn't go, I think as deep because you didn't know what the contour lines were of a mountain pass or did this road go through because maps only get updated, well, not very often. And so in 2016, 17, 18, I was on this trip and you're right, back bike packing started to really emerge. I mean, there were different websites that came up. People were posting routes and blogs with elevation gain and with mileages and dropping waypoints on maps. You can see where there was a hotel or where there was a water or food resupply points. And when I was in places like Northern India and rural Nepal and Eastern Tibet and then Kyrgyzstan and Morocco, there still wasn't this this network of information so we're still kind of just fumbling my way and, and figuring this out. But it was, I, I definitely, I'm not going to take credit for anything because I'm not getting credit for it, but I definitely felt like I was at the early stages of what bike packing w- was and has become now. And for sure, COVID has, has really helped propel that, right? So the idea of people wanting to get out and ride their bikes, like think about when COVID was, was really in full force, how hard was it to, to buy a new bike or let alone just get new brake pads or a chain, right? So everyone was, was getting into it, which is amazing for the industry and amazing for the sport and mostly for the lifestyle. But it's just, it's been really amazing to see so many people getting out and adventuring and being curious. And people talk about like, you know, how do you get into bikepacking? Just go ride your bike someplace, stay overnight for one night and then come home. And if that felt okay, try something else, try a full weekend. And it's just, it's, it's really cool to see where this is going. I like that you use that word curious. Yeah. It's such yeah. a powerful word, word right? Because it, it, yeah. it, it really opens things up. If you become curious about exploring, if you become curious about wanting to meet people who don't look like you and sound like you and don't have that same background, that, that level of openness and curiousness, I think, is so incredibly important. Talk a little bit more about that. And, and how that, how do you keep that curiosity and that, that stoke alive? <laughs> you know, I think it's kind of been, I don't know, drilled into me or just inborn in me since I was a little kid, right? Getting that bike for the first time, wanting to ride out into the country. But mostly I think uh, directly or indirectly, my, my dad's got a lot uh, of input into this. So my dad is a great guy. He's turning 90 on August 1st. And he's a former, he's a Korean war veteran, right? So he's, he's used to living his life by a certain military mindset. And I grew up that way. And so there wasn't, it wasn't a democracy. You didn't get to ask questions. If it was below 40 degrees, you had to wear an undershirt and you eat what's on your plate. Cause this isn't a restaurant. And yeah, I'm not saying it's a bad thing. It made me who the person I am today. But at the same time, if you ever seen the movie, uh, like cool hand Luke, with uh, mm-hmm. right. Paul Newman. Right. Right. And so that was one of our favorite movies growing up as a kid. And so we'd watch that. We'd probably seen it five, six times together. And in the scene, 
uh, when he actually goes to prison, for those of you who haven't seen it. So Paul Newman is this rather charming, gregarious guy who's always sort of pushing the limits on, on rules and regulations in life. And he finally gets caught and he goes to jail. And the warden says to him, what we have here is failure to communicate. Right. My dad would say that to me a lot. And I guess the long of that story is that everything that my dad put into place as far as rules was just had to be taken at face value, which made me sort of want to be more rebellious and more curious. So when I got that first bike, I started riding into the countryside. It made me more curious, want to know what's over this, what's around this corner, what's over this hill. Later in life, I started thinking about, okay, what's in this country and what's over that mountain pass? Like, why is this the highest motorable road in the world at 18,000 feet? What's at the top? What's on the backside? And I just think that, I, I don't know, I'm just, I'm, I'm 49 right now, which I don't say that very often out loud, but it's, I'm getting used to it. Um, but I think I'm still just this, this big goofy kid at heart that I'm just curious about life. And I think the more people that I meet who meet my, my energy, who match my curiosity, the more it kind of feeds my own curiosity. So when I met that Swiss couple in Nepal who was doing this amazing stuff, you know, they weren't talking about getting home to, to buy that new car or do these other things. They were talking about these new experiences and that just further fuels my, uh, my interest and intrigue. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Um, so going back to the, the, the bike packing movement and how it's really taken off and then the technology and, and sort of the, that layer, um, in your perspective, because you were out there doing it with paper maps and all of that, is it taking away some of the, the challenge and taking away some of the adventure? Um, is, is it eroding some of the, that, necessity for, for curiosity and shifting it with, you know, of necessity and knowing exactly where that water drop is or that cache of, <laughs> of trail, you know, trail angel magic. I mean, what's your take on that? I mean, obviously there's pros and cons. I think it's actually doing good things for it, right? Because, because reading a map and trying to figure out where you are, on that map is sometimes challenging. Like, well, have I ridden three miles? Am I to this junction point? Yeah, like it's, it's hard to really, to get a bearing sometimes. Whereas with offline GPS, you can see exactly where you are on the routes. People have added waypoints, as I've mentioned. And I think if nothing else, it gets you to push yourself even further. Because if you look at a paper map and you see like this little squiggly spaghetti lines, like, oh, this goes into this little ravine. I can see the contour lines. I don't really know what's in there. So I'm probably not going to go there because I just really don't know. But now you can see when you can zoom in on these offline GPS maps, you have all this different data and it makes you kind of go deeper into the exploration. And also to like my buddy, Ryan, who you've talked to, like, he's doing really, really good videos, trying to inspire people. And he's giving people waypoints and he's telling them what the mileage is. And I think all those things further help this movement to get people out and to ride their bikes, to go adventuring on their bikes. Because, you know, when I grew up, people would, they'd get in their cars, you know, and they'd go to the lake for the weekend. And that was cool. And that was, that was their adventure. There's nothing wrong with that, but it's a different kind of adventure, right? And so now the more people that get on bikes, the more people share their stories, the more people get inspired, the more people write about it online or stay with people at uh, New Warm Showers. I think that probably the biggest thing that I learned through my travels, honestly, is that everyone who I met along the way, people are just people, right? So they, they're curious, they're empathetic, they're kind, they're generous. And, and I think that's been the biggest takeaway with, with all of my travels is that the human connection and the, and the power of that human connection. Yeah. And if we reframe mm. our relationship with time, yeah. And, uh, and, and hopefully be able to, you know, pique that curiosity and think about ways that we can add a little bit of adventure to our life. And I'm kind of with you. It, it sounded like, um, 
I, I look at the, the changes that have been, have been taking place in, in really sort of democratizing uh, not only content creation. I mean, I'm a public health guy, you know, producing content out on the, on the yeah. interwebs here, uh, on the YouTube channel here. And, um, but also in this realm, in terms of democratizing and making it a little bit more accessible to try to embrace more people to adventure a little bit and to live a healthier, more active lifestyle maybe rethink how their addiction towards success and power and money mm. and obsessiveness with time will hopefully reframe things and, and give us an opportunity to get out there and explore a little bit. Um, and, you know, and I would say, guys, you know, go pick up this book. I mean, cause the <laughs> world is spinning by you, you know, it's, it's like, come on. It, it, I mean, this is, this has really been an absolute joy for me to be able to connect with you. Uh, Jerry, is there anything that we haven't discussed yet that you want to make sure that we leave the audience with? It's a great question. I, I don't think so. Like it'll probably come to me later, but just being able to. It's too late con- then, you know, yeah, you <laughs> missed it. Oh, and by the way, right. No, we, yeah. we talked oh, about the, the importance. We talked about the importance of bikes. We talked about the value of French fries. And so I think those are probably two really good takeaways. Yeah. But uh, no, it's just been, it's been really fun talking to you. You, pr- you produce a really great show. I love your visuals and you're, you're doing good stuff, right? Like you're not just some clown out there talking about things that nobody cares about that don't matter. Like the stuff that you talk about and the stuff, the movement you're promoting matter. And so I love this. Well, I appreciate you saying that. And I really appreciate uh, Ryan Van Duzer getting us in touch. Uh, that's fantastic. Uh, how can folks uh, best follow along with your work and your adventures uh, other than the book? Obviously, get the book, yeah. uh, folks. But uh, I, I believe you're, you're, you're out on the interwebs as well. I'm out on the interwebs. So I think you've talked about the website. We can find out about yep. my, my blogs, the stories that I've written. Uh, you can also pick up a copy of the book. So it's look at that. You've got a YouTube <laughs> channel. Boom. I've got a YouTube channel as well. It's nice. not quite as prolific as some other people's, but a lot of those videos out there are from my travel. So you can find that uh, on my name and probably in the show notes right there at the bottom of the screen. And, and I'm, I'm also, pressing uh, it and boom, you're on Instagram too. There it is, right? So it's yeah. just if you go find me uh, at Jerry Kopeck on Instagram, you'll uh, you'll find some of my stories and some of my adventures. Sweet. I love it. I love it. I I look forward to meeting you in person, Uh, Jerry. It's been an absolute joy and pleasure. Thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. Uh, And I expect that when you do come through town, we have a guest room. And so it's got your name on it. Awesome. I love it. I love it. And again, uh, another plug for Warm Showers. Uh, Folks, if this is the first time that you're hearing about this organization, I cannot say enough wonderful things about uh, Warm Showers. I I have friends that have uh, participated and used the facilities. Uh, A good friend, Jim Sayer, uh, who uh, travels around the country uh, by bike, used to be the executive director of the Adventure Cycling Association. Uh, He uses Warm Showers. I believe he might be a host as well uh, and, uh, and and thank you to all of those folks who are tuning in listening to this or watching this if you are a Warm Showers host thank you, thank you, thank you for doing that it really makes a world of difference for those people who are getting out trying to explore and again this is not just in North America this is worldwide oh. boom yeah. correct we are all 161 over the 161 different countries yeah yeah it's uh, it's phenomenal Fantastic. Again, Jerry, thank you so very much. This has been awesome. Thanks, John. Hey, thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you've enjoyed this episode with Jerry. And if you have, please give it a thumbs up. (laughs) Leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, I'd be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Just click on that subscription button down below and ring the notifications bell. And if you are enjoying this content, I'd be honored to have you uh, be a part of my Active Towns Ambassadors. Uh, Support me out on Patreon and or buy me a coffee. And don't forget, I've got some fun uh, Streets are for People swag out on the uh, website there. So uh, in the Active Town store. Uh, again, thank you so much for tuning in. I really appreciate it. And until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers.
And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me a Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much.